Let's give it up for the worship team, huh? Well, good morning. I'm, I'm so privileged. Every time I get up here, and I was telling some of our elders this morning, every time I get up here, I'm just reminded of what God has done in my life. And this morning, things are going to be a little bit different than our normal service, uh, and you'll kind of get the drift of why. Uh, so this morning, as we get in, some of you are familiar with this movie director who likes to start his movies at the beginning, but then he switches real quick and goes to the end of the movie, and then it works his way backwards. Uh, so that's what we're going to do this morning. So I want you, we're closing chapter eight of our summer in Rome. And I got, for me personally, as I prepared for this message, chapter eight has, and I think is, one of the most beautiful chapters in the entire Bible. Because there's this progression of God telling us his truth that the Apostle Paul writes in it. And so open up your Bibles to Romans chapter 8, and we're going to start. At, we're going to read from God's word, and then we're going to come back to it. Uh, so don't lose that spot, because this whole morning we're in chapter 8. So here we go. Chapter 8, verse 31 to 39 says, What then shall we say of these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him gloriously give us all things? Who shall bring these charges against God to the left? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long as we are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? So this morning, yeah, you can give God a hand. So this morning, I know some of you are waiting for the big idea. It's coming later. So just relax. I will let you know when, it's, when we're there. So this morning, as I read through these verses, I felt like, and let me give you a little background on how we get selected or Paul tells us when we get to preach. Prior to this, we would all kind of sit down and Paul would tell us his vacation time. We tell him our vacation and then we kind of fill in the slots as he takes time off and, and gets some rest that he well deserves. And so that's how we did it before. Well, this time was a little different. This time, he just sent an email to all of us and says, you're preaching this weekend, you're preaching this weekend. I was like, all right, well, I got the 14th. Okay, that's awesome. Uh, not really because I was on vacation, and so I had to work around that, uh, and I really had to check my heart during that process because I was like, man, I'm on vacation, and I got to be preparing for a message right when I'm, how, Paul, come on now. But then I said, okay, stop. And I read chapter 8, the entire, the entire chapter, and man, these words, as I read them, I was like, man, these words sound so familiar. Why? And yes, I read Romans chapter 8 before, but it was different. You ever have that moment where you're reading something or you're watching a movie, and you're like, man, I feel like I, this is, man, where did I see this? Where did I hear this? Well, yes, I know I heard it in God's word. But as I was sitting there preparing, and I always like to read different versions of Scripture, uh, and as I was reading, I looked up, and this very Bible right here sits in my bookcase. This is one of my first Bibles that I ever received as a Christian. I grabbed it down, and as I was reading, I saw that this was already highlighted, and there's already some notes in there. Well, these verses, this very chapter was read to me when I came forward to know more about Jesus. That way, and I was like, okay, this is why this means so much to me. And yes, I'll take the challenge. I don't care if I'm on vacation. I want to share because this right here is what got me to believe in Jesus Christ. And so I want us to go back to the very beginning of chapter 8 and verse 1 because there's a lot of stuff 
in this chapter that I think as believers and as Christians, sometimes we forget. You know, Paul talked about it last week that sometimes our prayers, we don't even know what to pray anymore. And yes, we may pray, God, your will be done. But man, when we say that, do we really mean that? When you're praying for that job promotion and you're saying, God, your will be done. And then they tell you, no, we passed up on you. Do you just not get frustrated? Or you're applying, you know, you're looking to buy a house and you're shopped all over the place and you're like, this is our house. I really feel that God has got this house for us. And you pray, God, your will be done. And then they tell you, yeah, your offer got declined. And you get so frustrated, right? And, and the, or you go to the doctors and you've been, you know, praying, God, your will be done. I want those tests to come back negative. I don't want to have cancer. And you're praying that and then they come back and say, yeah, sorry, you have cancer. And you get so frustrated. You say, God, Really? So I think there are times in our lives that we like we pray God's will, but sometimes we really don't want God's will. We want our will. And I've been there. Recently, my wife and I, we, we, we were there. We were looking to, we're renters. We don't own a house. We rent. And we're all perfectly fine with that. And we were looking to move. And the reason why we were looking to move is because my wife and I feel that our call on our life is to be foster parents and to adopt kids. And as we kind of talked about it and we said, hey, we will want to continue to grow our family, but our house is too small. Okay, let's begin to pray that if it's in God's will, he will find the proper home for us. And so we did that. We started praying. We started looking at houses, and we go to this first house in La Palma, and we go, and it's an F. Okay, that's okay. It's the first house. No big deal. So we keep praying through it, and we see another house happen to be La Palma. Apparently, La Palma does not want the Garcias to be residents of it. That's what we figured out, and that's okay, because we don't want to be La Palma residents. So we find another house in La Palma, and, and man, everything was looking great. We hit it off with the realtor. It was awesome. We're like, no, we got chemistry with her. It's good. It's going to be awesome. And we thought we had it, and then it was, no, we went with someone else. And I remember looking at my wife. I was like, well, maybe we're not supposed to be foster parents anymore. Maybe this is it. Maybe our family is just us, and that's it. Well, that's okay. Our, and I just remember being so first, God, really? Like, how, how are you telling me no right now? So I was, we were getting so frustrated with it. And then out of nowhere, we kind of had given up. God opened the door and led us to the house that we're currently in. More than we could ever think of or pray for. It's beautiful. It's awesome. And so we know that God's hand is there. But man, we forget that as Christians. We forget it in our walk. And if you've been a Christian 19, 20 years, 30 years, or maybe you still have questions and you're still here. Man, it's okay to have questions. It's okay to get frustrated. Paul reminds us of that in, in this entire chapter. And there's amazing promises that he has for us in his word. So open up Romans chapter 8, verse 1, I think is the first and most beautiful promise. There is there no now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. What a way to open up the chapter. Right away, the Apostle Paul writes, hey, there is no condemnation on your life as a believer. And I think sometimes we forget that as believers, as sin, as we sang earlier, earlier, that the sin no longer tangles us up, but sometimes we feel like we're trapped. And Paul's saying, hey, there is no condemnation on your life. You've accepted him as your Lord and Savior. There is no condemnation on your life. Verse 5 says, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Man, what an encouragement that Paul is telling us, hey, set your things on the things of heaven, not on the things of this earth. Don't look at here right now. And then he continues in verse 12 through 18 says, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoptions as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if, and, and if children then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. 
For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Man, what an awesome reminder that yes, we will suffer, but it's okay because the glory that awaits us is far better than the suffering that we will encounter today. And as Christians, we have got to read that and be okay and say, you know what? I will suffer for the sake of Christ, and that is okay. Look, I think we live in a society that there's absolutely no way you can say we're not suffering right now. But yet our response to that suffering, I don't think it's been what it should be. At least for me, it hasn't. We get frustrated with everything that is going around our society, with our nation, with our politicians, with everything. And we get so frustrated. And I think we, social media, as great as it is, it's an outlet, I think, sometimes for us where we throw up. And we post our opinions and about politics, and it's like, but you know what? Even, even this week as I was sitting there reading, it's like, this is the suffering that Paul talks about. We are going to suffer. Why? Because this country and every country is ran by man and not God, unfortunately. And that's okay, so let's suffer well. Edgar, will you suffer well in the midst of all this? Whether you agree with any decision that is being made, will you just be okay with it? And trust that God is still God, and he is sitting on the throne. And we know the end and the way it all ends. Who wins? God does. So rather than throw up on Facebook and be that person that's like, oh, I hate this, and I don't like this, and let's chant about this and that. You know what? Just post pictures of your food. That's all we really care. Let's be real. Let's be real. All I care is what restaurant did you eat, and did you like it? Because I want to go try it. So post pictures about your food, your kids, your vacation. Forget the politics stuff. Post some verses on there. Be an encourager. Be telling the world that, you know what? We're going to suffer, and this is it. We're suffering right now. But you know what? The beauty that awaits us is far greater than this immediate suffering that we must endure and we must go through. Because there are times in our life and, and I'm going to ask you some questions. And raise your hand. Don't be ashamed. But have you ever felt like nothing's going right in your life? You've been applying for that job and, or, or you walked into your current job this past Friday. And as you walked in, you're like, this is great. This is awesome. I'm going to work. And you get called into the office. And your boss looks at you and says, hey, you have to downsize. Thank you for your services. But we no longer need you. You're like, What? You ever felt that? Like, really? Or maybe you walked home and your spouse looked at you in the face and said, sorry, honey, I want a divorce. And you're like, but everything was going so good. I, I thought it was. Or for you young ones here, your boyfriend or your girlfriend gave you that Christian breakup. I just feel God's calling us in different directions. <laughs> right? And so, and you're going, what? But I thought we were meant to be forever. Or maybe you walked into the doctor's office and you got that response that you did not want to hear, that you have cancer or a loved one, grandma, mom, brother, sister, son, daughter has cancer. And you're going, God, what? Are you serious? Or maybe yours is not all that drastic. Maybe your car just broke down and it's going to cost you a few hundred dollars to repair your car, but then you look at your bank account and you look at the stack of bills and you're like, I can't afford to fix my car. God, really, where are you, God? Where are you? Have you ever said that? I know I have. 20 years this September, that's where I found myself. I found myself saying, God, where are you? Now, I didn't believe in God at that time. I believed in a higher power. I believed that there was a God, but I didn't have a personal relationship with him. And that night, as I sat in my room, just in my sorrows, my drug of choice was alcohol. That was my drug of choice. And as I sat and I thought that the pain that could only be sealed was through drinking my sorrows away, only left me with a bunch of open bottles, empty ones too. And as I sat there contemplating taking my life, staring at the barrel of a nine millimeter, saying, God, where are you? You took two people that I love away from me and that I love them dearly. And you took them. Really? That's the God that everybody loves and and serves? 
Where are you? And I came to this church. I ended up here. And that day, a man by the name of Joe Vaughn, that some of you know, uh, and shook his hand. Joe, would you stand? Joe, I want to say thank you. Thank you for being a faithful servant of God. Because you stood right here, Joe. Now, I don't know if you remember because it's 20 years ago. But you stood right here. Waiting. And for me, what seemed to be a marathon to walk 30 steps, because that, at that time I sat right here. I'm going to come sit next to you. I sat right here. My mother-in-law and my wife were here. At that time, she was not my wife, but I sat right here. And when that time of invitation to accept Christ Jesus was given, I sat here listening to that message, and I said, yeah, I'm not walking forward. It's too long. And I'm going to be the only one. And everybody's going to know that I have a messed up life and that I need Jesus. I don't want to walk up here. I believe God pushed me all the way up here. He chased me, and I came up here to Joe, and Joe took me to the back, because we have decision counseling rooms in the back. He took me back there, and when I began to ask Joe questions, Joe read this chapter to me. He read those verses to me, and I want you to open your Bibles up again, and let's read verse 31 to 39 again. It says, what then shall we say of these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who died did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. He will not also with him, he will, he will, he, how will he not also with him gloriously give us all things? And Joe paused right there. He said, Edgar, God wants to give you everything. He wants to give you his son. He wasn't talking about finances. He wasn't talking about that. He was, Jesus wants to give you his son. God wants to give you his son. He already did. You just need to accept him, Edgar. And he continued and he said, who shall bring charges against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us, who shall separate us from the love of Christ. So shall tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sore, as that is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than con conquerors through him who loved us. And he paused again and says, Jesus loves you, Edgar. He gave his son for you. There is no condemnation on your life if you accept him. He is ready to give you everything. He said, look, he already told you, you're, you would be an heir of his. He wants to give you everything. Why would you not? Look at all the stuff, and I had shared my story with Joe, and he's like, look at all the stuff you've gone through. Really? Why would you not? And he says, now all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. He says, Edgar, there you go. What are you waiting for? And I said, perhaps one of the many dumb things that I say, Joe Butt. Joe Butt. And he goes, wait, no, no, no. And here's the big idea. No ifs and ors or buts about it. And if you know Joe, you can already hear that tone as he looked at me. I don't know this man. I don't know this man from Adam. This is the first time I've met Joe. And he looks at me and he says, there is no and, ifs, or buts about it. He loves you. He wants to free you from your sin, and he wants you to be more than a conqueror. Not victorious, but he wants you to be more than a conqueror. Come on, what are you waiting for? Joe, and I said it again, Joe, but I wanted an excuse 
to not do it. Joe would not let me go. And I believe it wasn't Joe. I believe it was God using Joe. And I believe it was God saying, hey, you're not leaving here today. I will chase you like a hound. And I believe that's what God wants from all of us. He loves you. And I know that some of you have been Christians for a long time, as myself. But man, it's, I, I want to encourage you and challenge you. Do you believe all those promises? When life gets tough, when it's hard, and you want to just be like, God, I, where are you? Believe in these promises that God, that nothing can separate you from his love. When you fall to sin, this is not a get out of jail free card, but know that there is no condemnation on your life if you've accepted him. We are all going to fail. We're not perfect. We're being perfected. We're never going to get this 100% right, I believe, this side of heaven. But every day, God is trying to perfect us to the image and the likeness of Christ, is what Scripture says. And you are going to fail. Know that right now. You are going to fail. The harder you try, the more you're going to be like, ah, oh, I messed up again. But know that Jesus says there's no condemnation in you. But we have got to strive to be better and better followers of Christ. And I think often we settle. We settle and as Christians, and the longer we, become, we, we are in the faith, the easier it is to settle. I believe sometimes we read verses like this, and we take them as get-out-of-jail-free cards. Well, there's no condemnation in my life. I accepted them 19 years ago, so therefore I'm going to go party, drink it up, and do and live like I want to live. That's what we do. But that's not what this verse is saying. This verse is not giving you that Joe get out of free card. We need to serve God because of what he did for us. And I believe that this is why he tells us how much he loves us. Think of, for those of you who are married, think back on those, that day when you gave your vows to your spouse. And times get tough, Right? But do you love your spouse any less, even when your wife is not lovable or your husband is not lovable? No, you love them exactly the same. It doesn't change. Yeah, challenging times are going to come. But you love them no matter what. And you will do, I mean, some of you said this in your vows, till death do us part. In goodness, in sickness, whether we're poor or rich, I'm going to love you. That's what God is saying. He says, I love you no matter what. But that doesn't mean that as husbands or wives, we're like, okay, she told me that 20 years ago, 15 years ago. I'm good. I'm going to go ahead and do whatever I want with whoever I want. No, there was still a vow and a covenant that you made before God between you and your spouse. And in the same way, there was a covenant that you made before God when you came forward and you accepted him as your Lord and Savior. You said, God, I love you. And I want you to be my Lord and my Savior and so therefore, I will set my mind and my, and my heart on the things of heaven, not things of this earth. We have got to strip that away. We have got to strip that away and say, no, I will live for heaven and for God. And set your minds on that. And so believer, brother and sister in Christ, do a heart examination. Where are you? Where are you right now as a follower of Christ? Do you have that jail out of, get out of jail free card? Or are you saying, no, man, I, me and Jesus are good. I love Jesus. I serve Jesus. I give to Jesus. I'm all about Jesus. Then awesome. Keep doing it. And when you get discouraged, go back to this verse and think through this. Read through it. Maybe you have a verse that was read to you however many years ago. This week, I want to challenge you. Go back. Find that verse or verses and think back. Why did you give your life to Christ? Why? And then do what I did. Because when I read that, I was like, okay. Look, even Pastor Paul last week, and I love the way sometimes that he confesses his shortcomings of prayer time. Man, that's encouraging. As a pastor, to me, to see my lead pastor confess that, hey, I have shortcomings. And sometimes when I pray, I don't know what to pray. 
Because I think as pastors, we feel the pressure that we got to stand up here and have live this life that is just unattainable. And when I heard him say that, it's like, I struggle with prayer. I start praying and I start thinking about dinner. I start thinking about a bunch of other stuff that is not prayer. I have the hardest time closing my eyes and praying. Because my mind just goes, I don't have ADD. At least I don't think I do. But I feel like I have prayer ADD. Because as soon as I start to pray, it's like, no names to be mentioned, but in our staff meeting, uh, I, we were in prayer, and man, that prayer was, it was a good time in prayer, and somebody in our staff just fell asleep. <laughs> Four snore and everything, and it was, it, it was really comical and fun, and he admitted that he's like, no, I was just deep in prayer. Man, you were so deep in prayer that we heard you uh, out loud. But we get that. We all get that. Sometimes we don't know what to pray. We don't know what to ask. But you know, when you don't know what to ask or you don't know what to pray for, you go to your brothers and sisters in Christ and you ask them, here's what's going on in my life. And I want God's will to be done. But I really don't. Here's what I really want. And you let someone intercede for you. Let someone jump in for you. And remind, remember that God loves you and there is his, his love is everlasting. That's how much he loves you. I think this morning, again, as I prepared for this, I was just constantly reminded of that, how much God loves me and that there is nothing that I could do that will separate me from his love, that I'm going to mess up, and he loves me unconditionally. That is refreshing. 20 years later, that did something to my soul. It's like, wow, God, thank you. These verses mean even more now than they did 9, 20 years ago. And thank you for rescuing me. I'm ready for whatever you have next. So this morning, I'm going to invite the worship team to come back. And we're going to allow just a time of prayer. And here's kind of different things that I want to happen uh, some of our elders and our deacons and life group leaders and pastors are going to be up here. And if you're here and you've been coming week after week and you still have questions about God, here's what I will tell you. Even once you come to know Christ, you're still going to have questions. The questions never stop. You're always going to have them. I stand before you 20 years later. I still have a lot of questions. And I went to Bible college. I still have a lot of questions. But here's what I know about God. That if I and my mind can wrap my mind around God, I don't know that I want to serve that God. God is so big that our minds cannot fathom how big he is. And that is okay. Bring your questions. And as you bring your questions, I will tell you this. There is no, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. God loves you and wants you to be his son and his daughter. He wants to give you his kingdom. He wants you to be an heir of heaven. So bring your questions. And I know that you're sitting over there, and it's far. It's far. Trust me. It felt like a marathon. But be courageous. And walk down here, and one of our pastors, elders, deacons will take you back there and answer any questions that you may have. Maybe we'll schedule. This, this is just the beginning of the conversation. Here's what I want you to know, that this is not the end of the conversation. This will just be the beginning of the conversation. We're not going to take you right to the back and tell you, do you want to get baptized right now? Maybe you do. Maybe that's you, and we'll figure that out. Maybe we'll schedule it. Maybe we'll just do it tonight, this afternoon, whatever we have to do. But don't think you're, that it's a pressure time that we're going to ask you to make a decision right now. We just want to answer your questions, and we want to have a conversation with you. Or maybe this morning you just need prayer. Maybe you just need prayer. Maybe you're saying, I don't even know how to pray no more. Or maybe you're saying, yeah, I, I, as you mentioned verses, I have a verse that was shared with me, and I'm not where I was or I need to be. But I'm ready to get back on track. And the rest of you, as you stand, will you worship God? And worship out of this. 
knowing that his love is everlasting and that there is no condemnation on your life. Praise him for that. And and sing it out loud. It's okay if the neighbors call the cops because we're too loud. We'll send the deacons to go take care of that. But sing it out loud. Don't be afraid. Don't be ashamed. Because he is not ashamed of you. Church, let's stand and let's worship at this time.